Hello, dear friends and dear students. I hope you people will be fine and enjoying a very sound health. Today, I'm going to upload another very interesting and uh, informative video lecture related to periviscite solar cells. And uh, this video and the lecture will be very informative and helpful for those students who are just going to start their research career in periviscite solar cells or they are trying to find some research gap and their proposed solution and future work. So I have just prepared a tentative draft so that I can start my today's lecture. Uh, let me share my screen with all of you. Okay, uh, dear students, you can see I have just shared my screen and uh, now I'm going to start my today's lecture. And uh, first of all, I would like to <clears throat> emphasize the title of my today's video lecture and uh, why I'm going to address this uh, lecture and what will be the significance of today's lecture. So particularly you can see over here, today's uh, lecture is about uh, tin-based periviscite solar cells. And uh, <clears throat> particularly a lot of people are working in tin-based periviscite solar cell domain. And uh, uh, because uh, when we talk about the periviscite solar cells, the most prominent uh, periviscite solar cells are basically lead-based, but lead-based lead periviscites are toxic and uh, they have very harmful effect on human and animal life. Therefore, we need to find some alternative candidates and tin is one of the most important candidate due to having better optoelectrical properties, a better absorption capability, higher carrier mobility and um, uh, like that. So, and also have uh, lower band gap values and it's Optoelectrical properties are very close to the lead and it is non-toxic and environmental free additive that can replace um, the uh, that, that, that can replace the toxic nature of the lead bisparabiscite. So let's start <clears throat> for, uh, for today's work. Uh, particularly you can see that I'm going to address the following main important things because uh, when a student is going to start its research career or a student is going to start his thesis, either master's thesis or PhD thesis, yeah, or we can say that uh, they, are, uh, they are on initial stage, they need to know some basic things. Uh, particularly when we talk about uh, periviscite solar cells, we must know about the current challenges. What are the challenges for particularly tin-based periviscite? And uh, a student need to know about the research gap uh, definitely a research gap can be easily uh, determined from reading some literature, some good review papers. Uh, and, uh, and the third thing is how we can improve the performance parameters of tin-based periviscite. What can be their proposed solution? And in last, we will discuss about the future of the tin-based periviscite, how they can significantly attract the market on a local level or commercial level, how we can... <clears throat> use them on large scale, how we can address their problems tentatively. So these are some particular uh, key points that I'm going to address. Today's video lecture will cover not only for lab point of view importance, but also for theoretical point of view, but also for simulation purpose. So three areas will be addressed for today's lecture, like lab work, like uh, mathematical work, uh, like uh, simulation work as well. So my most of values are particularly on SCAPS 1D simulation tool that is being used for simulation of solar cells and periviscite solar cells. And they have very uh, great role uh, in the research work as well. So first of all, I need to explain a typical structure of the periviscite solar cells so that I can start from this structure and onward. So I have just uh, designed a tentative <clears throat> periviscite solar cell structure over here so that I can explain the functionality of the each rail, uh, the working principle of the this periviscite solar device and what are the basic structures normally we can simulate, we can design in lab work as well. So uh, <clears throat> it can be seen that uh, uh, normally a periviscite, uh, periviscite structure is consist of the following main important layers. When we talk about uh, the periviscite layer, this is a periviscite layer. If I'm going to label over here, this layer is basically sandwiched between a P-type material and the N-type material. Particularly, basically, mainly uh, these two P-type and N-type semiconductor material normally uh, uh, is centralized uh, layer is basically the periviscite layer. And then there is a layer of glass and uh, 
back metal contact and the front metal contact. And coming to the, this point of view, uh, you can see over here in the lower portion, we have the sunlight. Uh, uh, the incident sunlight normally determines either after our structure will be an IP or we can say that or PIN. Basically, there are two structures mainly when we talk about uh, uh, the periviscite solar structure, first one is basically NIP, second one is basically PEIN architecture. Uh, in short, uh, if I'm trying to talk about the technical wording, <clears throat> Uh, inverted and non-inverted architectures. When we talk about uh, uh, non-inverted architecture that are basically NIP, when we talk about inverted architecture, they are basically PIN architecture. And the incident light normally uh, determines either your structure will be NIP or PIN. In this case, we can see over here, the light is being incident from the bottom of the portion from N-type N -type material, paraviscite and HDL. So it is basically what kind of structure it is basically an IP structure. In my later video, I will also try to upload <clears throat> and I will also try to make some uh, good videos on PIN architecture as well. And <clears throat> if I talk about the second structure that is PIN architecture, if light is being incident from uh, this portion, like you can see over, first of all, HTL material, paraviscite and ETL, opposite than that of the NIP architecture. So we can say that this is a PIN architecture, inverted architecture. Both architectures have their own importance like NIP architectures have more efficiency and lower stability, PIN are more stable and lower efficiency like that. Same case with third architecture normally, which are mesoscopic, mesoscope. <clears throat> mesoscopic or some people normally also call them uh, mesoporous architecture. It's not a different than that of this uh, NIP and PIN architecture. Just we normally try to place a layer of mesoscopic layer between uh, periviscite and ETL or normally we try to put a mesoscopic layer between uh, HDL and the periviscite. So mesoscopic structures uh, can be PIN, can also be uh, NIP. But well, we have seen that among these, all the architecture, these structures are more efficient and more stable as compared to uh, NIP, PIN, uh, et cetera. So mesoscopic structure have their own uh, better superior uh, efficiency and stability as compared to PIN and NIP. But these third one architecture are mostly implemented in lab point of view. But in case of uh, simulation work, we have seen a lot of simulation work on NIP and PIN architecture. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to focus upon the working principle of this structure. Uh, actually, one of the most important layer is basically paraviscite layer. Uh, the role of periviscite layer is to what uh, this layer basically attracts the uh, beam of light incident photons and and tend to generate uh, tentative charge carriers. There are two type of charge carriers. We know that electron and holes, and these charge carrier like electron and holes are being uh, being. Um, attracted by a respective transporting layer. Like if I'm talking about the whole transport layer, the holes will be extracted by HDL material and uh, the electrons will be extracted by ETL material. The efficiency of structure normally increases when we have better extraction capabilities of HDL material and better extraction capabilities of ETL material for tentatively electrons and holes as well. So, and ultimately these holes uh, are being collected towards this back metal electrodes and these electrons are being collected by front metal electrode. Both these electrodes, like we can say that if I'm try, trying to talk more simply, this is a positive charge and this is a negative charge. Both potential, positive and negative creates a potential barrier between back metal contact and front metal contact, just like a battery terminals. So <clears throat> probably we must have a better uh, absorption layer that must have a better absorption capability. And um, we must have a better HTL and ETL candidates that can extract the more carriers mobility towards their electrode. Uh, in this way, <clears throat> we can increase the 
efficiency and performance parameter of our device. But literally speaking, uh, generally speaking, when we talk about all these theoretical words, actually uh, there happen a lot of hazards, there happen a lot of problems that normally limits our <clears throat> lower uh, power conversion efficiency and performance parameter, particularly related to tin-based parallelistite. So uh, now I'm going to address what is the basic reason why we are still getting um, lower power conversion efficiency, why we have a poor performance parameter, particularly tin based paraviscite, and what are the limitations that uh, are basically resisting us for implementation of these paraviscite on large scale industrial and commercial level. So let's talk about uh, uh, like uh, other things that I'm going to talk about the problems. What are the problems we need to focus on lab point of view and uh, uh, on simulation point of view. So I have just put in some main key points. There can be a lot of other uh, key point as well, but uh, from a student for master's level and for PhD student, it, it will be a good start if we know about these particularly some points. So I have two portions. First one is the lab work. And second one is the basically, uh, unfortunately, this one is for experimental. Uh, this one is for experimental and this one is for simulation. So there is actually some missing simulation point of view. Okay. So when we talk about the lab point of view, the most important thing that we can see uh, about the tin-based paraviscite, when I'm, I'm talking about the tin-based paraviscite, uh, they have very poor oxidation state. Actually, what it means when they are exposed to sunlight, they actually change their oxidation state from SN plus two to SN four plus, which means that they tend to change their oxidation state, unstable, extremely unstable throughout the in, uh, environment. And uh, uh, they suffer a very poor oxidation state. And due to this poor oxidation state, we can see that the performance parameters are extremely degraded. And we can see that the stability of tin-based paraviscites are extremely, extremely poor when we are talking about without encapsulation, without surface protection. So normally what happens, normally some people use SNF2 additive, some other additives that can suppress the oxidation state uh, of uh, this tin-based paraviscite in order to improve the stability, in order to improve their performance parameter. Uh, so I just addressed two points related to lab point of view. Now I'm coming to the third one. They have very fast crystallization. It means what? when the thin film is being deposited on the surface. And after a few uh, duration of the time, uh, when it is being ex exposed to sunlight, it's uh, yellow face uh, quickly turns, uh, it's, it's black face, more stable face, uh, actually turns to quickly to yellow face. That uh, clearly indicates that uh, the poor oxidation, a poor stability and uh, more defects can be prominent when we have uh, uh, yellow face uh, suddenly after the film deposition. So uh, a stable structure must have a black face in order to have more uh, improved stability and performance parameter. So first castle crystallization, poor stability and poor oxidation state. And in case of the last one, th these are basically SN vacancy defects that they are more prominently in tin defects, tin based paraviscite defects. What happens uh, due to poor oxidation state due to poor stability, fast crystallization, our tin-based paraviscite behave like a P-type dopant, a P-type dopant. So what happens when uh, we have more defects, when we have poor stability, when we have poor oxidation state, our tin paraviscite behave like a P-type dopant and uh, this nature normally produces more uh, degradation performance parameters and uh, optoelectrical properties of tin-based paraviscite. So coming to the solution for lab point of view, we can use some antioxidative additives to suppress the oxidation state. And we could, uh, uh, could use some, use some uh, compositional engineering uh, like that we can, <clears throat> place some larger cations in order to improve the stability, in order to improve the crystallinity, fast crystallization process uh, of our uh, paraviscite. So coming toward the, uh, this one, the, the, this, this one, for the simulation point of view, through, or we can say that theoretical point of view, uh, because uh, uh, my mainly purpose is to address uh, the 
main uh, problem related to simulation related to mathematical procedures because a lot of people don't know don't <clears throat> go to their labs due to pandemic and they are still uh, stuck to their homes and uh, their rooms and they have lower facility of lab uh, lab work in their current universities therefore a lot of people try to use uh, some simulation tool that like scaps like matlab like uh, some other as well so that's why i mainly focus on simulation work when we talk about the tin based periscite the most important uh, point that normally comes to our mind that why 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 tin based periscite solar cells has lower voc values i'm going to elaborate about this point uh if i am talking about the tin based periscite the average value for a tin based periscite is still normally a 0.81 like uh, if i am talking about the lab point of view it is still limited to like 0.83 but in case of lead based periscite it is about 1.1 like two or three something so uh, it can be seen that the tin based periscite the voc value is extremely low that normally happens why uh, the voc value of the tin based periscite is normally probably uh, due to following the reasons we have poor band gap alignment for tin based periscite and that's why tin based periscite suffer from higher voc losses and when we talk about um, a tin based periscite the selection of etl or htl normally uh, what uh, uh, what they impact on the conduction band and valence band offset values they normally produce a lower valence band offset value and the conduction band offset value these both two values are mainly important for improving the band gap alignment the structure band gap alignment for any particular periscite normally depends upon the value of valence band offset value and conduction band offset value normally if we have better valence band offset value and conduction band offset value we could have better uh, band gap alignment we could have better voc uh, losses or lower voc losses and ultimately what happens the performance parameter and optoelectrical properties of our periscite structure will be increased and coming to the second one uh, normally we talk about the bulk defects bulk defects are normally surface defects i'm talking about surface defects uh, surface defect means that the the defects they are available on the surface of periscite uh, so <clears throat> there are two technical terms one term is basically bulk defects and second term is surface defects bulk defects are very important in performance degradation in performance improvement like if i'm talking about uh, lab point of view we must have better crystallinity of our periscite we must have better uh, grain size homogeneous distribution of the grain size and there should be no flickers and needle like structures uh, in our uh, periscite uh, layer if i'm talking about lab point of view uh, definitely better crystallinity improves the better absorption capability of uh, uh, periscite and if we have better absorption capability definitely it will generate large number of carriers electron and holes and ultimately what happens the performance parameter of our device will uh, tend to increase but in if we try to talk about uh, higher uh, surface defects or bulk defects what happens uh, there will be poor absorption capability and uh, the number of charge carrier generation will be lower uh, and uh, surface uh, uh, the diffu carrier diffusion length will be lower and the uh, carrier lifetime will also be lower ultimately what happens uh, there will be more uh, recombination defect between the periscite and interfaces and uh, in fact if i try to talk about the process of recombination we know that the merge the process of merging of electrons with holes is known as a recombination recombination process tend to increases when we have higher bulk defects uh, there are two kinds of uh, recombination uh, processes in periscite one kind is basically surface uh, recombination that normally arises on the periscite surface and second kind is basically interfacial uh, uh, recombination rate and normally we try to relate interfacial recombination with shockler red hall recombination rate and uh, these uh, shockler red hall recombination rates are second important uh, 
parameter that normally limits the performance parameter of 10 base paraviskite. We have a higher uh, interfacial defect in case of uh, 10 base paraviskite. And the, the reason behind is that we have more number of recombination rate between paraviskite and HDL and ETL and paraviskite interface. So ultimately, if we try to improve the interface between paraviskite, HDL, and ETL and paraviskite, would, we, would, we can suppress down the uh, this recombination rate, interfacial recombination rate. Uh, so uh, when we talk about the trap state defects, I just explained that interfacial defects that normally arises between the interfaces of uh, paraviskite HDL or ETL with paraviskite are known as trap, uh, trap state defects. And uh, these trap state defects are normally called interfacial defects and responsible for non radiative recombination rates. One of the key and hottest point in paraviscite solar cell to study about uh, and to passivate these non radiative recombination rate via some technique like interfacial engineering, like utilization of better HDL and ETL additives so that the carrier extraction capability will be improved, the, and like that. So, <clears throat> Ultimately, if we try to, if we want to fix uh, and if we want to make the improvement, we need to focus, we need to focus on these some particular points. We need to improve the band gap alignment. We need to improve the VOC losses. We need to find some uh, tentative uh, charge transporting layers that can improve our valence band and conduction band offset values. Uh, and we need to uh, find some uh, better absorp absorber layer that could have uh, better absorption capability that could have uh, be better uh, uh, incident photon conversion efficiencies and quantum efficiency as well. That definitely happens when, when we have lower surface defects, when we have better carrier extraction uh, absorption capability of our absorber layer. And we talk about the uh, interfacial defects. Interfacial defects can be improved with the selection of uh, uh, good uh, ETL and HCL material that, that, that can tentatively improve the balance band and conduction band offset values. So uh, let's move towards the uh, uh, next session that is about the mathematical session. So uh, one person how can find the uh, valence band offset value and how we can compute the conduction band offset values. What is the role of energy activation? What is the difference between spike and uh, uh, cliff structure as well. And the, this is another important session uh, for mathematical point of view, theoretical point of view, so that uh, one person can easily understand that can be the uh, main, main uh, research gap uh, for particular tin based paraviscite. So I'm moving towards the next section that is one of the key and important section for particularly all the students who are working in paraviscite domain work. Uh, so uh, over here, uh, I would like to first of all, focus on the main uh, title of my this page. It is about the calculation of uh, valence band offset value and conduction band offset value. Now I need to focus uh, why uh, what why I'm going to address and why I'm going to calculate why I'm going to emphasize on both these values like valence band offset value and conduction band offset value because we have just discussed that poor band gap alignment is mainly responsible for VOC losses for non radiative combination in tin with paraviscite. If we some way somehow can improve our valence band offset values, conduction band offset values, we can improve the band gap alignment of our structure. And definitely there will be uh, uh, lower VOC losses and ultimately we have better performance parameters. So now uh, uh, there is a clear direction. Uh, there is a clear gap that need to be focused. Like we need to find some uh, alternative key candidates th that can be replaced for typical spiral optimate that can be replaced typical ETL titanium dioxide. So that have better improvement in valence band and conduction band offset values. And second thing, I would talk about the cliff structure and spike structure and their difference and their significance and how cliff and spike sp structure can degrade or can improve the performance parameter. And in the last, I would talk about the calculation of uh, activation energy. And I will explain that how activation energy is basically linked with the valence band offset value 
and how activation energy is basically linked with the conduction band offset values. And same, we talk, we will talk, discuss about the, the role of activation energy with respect to cliff structure and with respect to spike structure. So uh, let's talk about some mathematical equations. These equations can be easily determined from any uh, particular uh, research paper, literature, and published article. So when we talk about the valence band offset value, I'm going to focus on the first point how we can determine uh, our valence band offset value, how we can determine our conduction band offset values. And third, I will focus on activation energy and what is the role of activation energy, how it can uh, increase the performance of our paraviscite device, how it can degrade the performance of paraviscite device, how uh, it is linked with cliff and spike structure. So when we talk about the valence band offset value, uh, there are two methods uh, to determine valence band offset value and conduction band offset value. First method is that we can determine valence band and conduction band from band gap alignment diagram as well. Each structure, uh, paraviscal structure has definitely uh, valence band, conduction band, and uh, and from that band gap alignment diagram, we can easily determine valence band and conduction band. But in this video, I'm going to talk about some mathematical equation. If we have uh, performance parameter related to HTL and ETL, how we can compute uh, uh, the valence band offset value and conduction band offset value with respect to parameter from uh, a paraviscite. So uh, parameters uh, like Para, uh, performance parameter like parametric values for HTL, paraviscite, and ETL can easily be determined for particular material from any published paper literature. Uh, so whenever you are going to study the paper, definitely each paper has some parametric values related to typical HTL material, typical ETL material, and paraviscite as well. So just, you just, just need to uh, find out some typical values in order to compute the valence band offset value, conduction band offset value, and from uh, valence band offset value, we can find the third equation, activation energy. So valence band offset value is basically the difference of what electron affinity value of HDL with electron affinity value of paraviscite and the uh, uh, band gap value of HTL and uh, the band gap value of the paraviscite. So when you are going to study any particular paper, definitely that paper must have some parametric values related to particular material. So if you are talking about spirooptimate, if you're talking about copper thiocyanide, if you're talking about uh, uh, copper oxide and uh, other additives, definitely you must have electron affinity value. If we, are, if we are going to talk about the paraviscite, either MA base, FA base, CZ, base, definitely it must have electron affinity value. So the valence band offset value can be determined via what the electron affinity uh, value difference with paraviscite and the band gap value difference with paraviscite. And similarly, second thing is conduction band offset value. Conduction band offset value can be determined with the difference of electron affinity value of the paraviscite with electron affinity value of the ETL. Now coming to the third one, that is basically activation energy. Activation energy uh, is normally determined with the absolute value of the band gap of the paraviscite. Definitely band gap value of the paraviscite is the one of the most important parametric values that uh, normally need to find from some literature, some from published paper, like I'm talking about FA-based paraviscites, band gap value is 1.41. If I'm talking about MA-based paraviscite, its band gap is about from 1.30, like 1.30 and 1.35. If I'm talking about the halide boromide, its band gap for particularly tin base is a little bit higher, like 2.15. So uh, absolute value of the band gap of the paraviscite with the difference of absolute value. I'm talking about the absolute value. Definitely, if you have valence band offset value negative, this uh, absolute function will kill the negativity. So ultimately what happens, you will have uh, mathematically either, if I'm talking about this one, you will have talk, uh, you will have either positive value or you will have a negative value. In similarly in case over here, uh, conduction band will be either positive or negative. Or like if I'm talking about conduction band will be higher, conduction band will be lower. If I'm talking about the energy exhibition, uh, activation energy, either it will be lower, either it will be higher. Now I'm going to talk about what happens 
if this valence band value is basically negative, if I'm going to talk about over here, I am going to put the value in this formula, in this formula, what happens, what happens if we have valence band offset value more negative, more lower, what we have, we will have activation energy smaller. This is very important point. Energy, activation energy is basically linked with the carrier recombination rate. Definitely, if we have negative valence band offset value or lower valence band offset value due to some selection of uh, non-suitable HTL material, we will what have, we will have uh, lower activation energy, smaller activation energy, which means that we will have higher recombination rate. Recombination rate, or uh, I have just pronounced this risk of recombination, chocolate red hole recombination, non reditive recombination, because a recombination is a total recombination rate is basically sum of radiative, non reditive, and ego one. But when we talk about the simulation, we are particularly focusing on non reditive recombination rates, and uh, they are more linked with interfacial uh, recombinations, either between paraviscite or ETL or. Uh, pa uh, pa pa paraviscite with HDL. So if you have a valence band offset value lower, valence band offset value negative, what will happen? We will have smaller uh, activation energy. Uh, it means what will happen? We will have higher non radiative recombination. If we have, will have higher non radiative recombination rate, there will be definitely performance degradation. Definitely, uh, there will be uh, performance uh, parametric uh, degradation. So ultimately we need to find some solution we need to find some, some uh, better candidates for htl or etl for better candidates for paraviscite that can uh, basically uh, improves our valence band offset value conduction band offset value so this is very important point for research